We still have plenty of openings for Sabbath study teacher at this time. So just wanted to give a friendly reminder that if you feel so inclined by the Holy Spirit, please contact me. Just give me a heads up and we'll be glad to write your name on in that we can fill a position that you can present for a Sabbath study school. Uh, we really could use your help. And I just wanted to say, for me, when I have done it, it's a really special blessing. That, um, it's an opportune time to, to, so to speak, grab that golden ring and take it. But the Holy Spirit will lead you out. If it seems intimidating, don't let it be intimidating. What it is, is it's a blessing waiting to be grabbed by yourself. Uh, the Spirit will lead you out. And it will. what I find is, uh, if, when you take the time to study the word, the bread will be broken to you. You'll receive the bread of life, and you'll be able to give it to others. The blessing is there, waiting for you to be, for you to take it. So I encourage you: grab it, come forth, volunteer. And the Lord will bless in special ways. Which ways? I'm not sure, but the blessing will be provided to you. So at this time, I'd like to uh, lead out with prayer. Can we please bow our heads reverently as we lead in prayer to our Heavenly Father? Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for this precious gift you've given us the Sabbath day, a day of rest, Father, where your peculiar children can come to you and receive your blessings and enjoy the rest which only you can provide to us. I want to thank you for all that you've given to us this week, Father, and continue to give to us. I ask that you anoint my lips, that you use this broken vessel that you glued back together and fill it up, Father, with your holy word, that it may pour out to your children. We know, Father, in your word it says that you are the potter and we are the clay. You will provide, Father. Thank you for all your loving kindness. In Jesus' precious name we pray. So today's title of our Bible study is, It Is Written. And the reason I've chosen that for a presentation today for our Bible study is, um, we find that time and time again, the Word of the Lord admonishes us to study His Word, receive His Word. If we know not His Word, how can we say that we are followers of Him? There's going to come a time very shortly when we're going to need to rely upon the word only in our heart and in our mind. Very shortly, this precious holy words of God will not be available to us. There will come a time when we're going to have his holy words imprinted in our heart and our mind. Um, the time will come, so let's be prepared now so when that day arrives, we can have the word and share it with others and give it to others and also be sanctified in the word ourselves. Um, opening up, uh, let's dive on into our study. I wanted to begin our study at 2 Timothy 3.16. So if you have your Bibles or your phones at this time, can you please turn to 2 Timothy 3.16 and give me a hearty amen when you have a right. And the scripture reads as following, all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. One, one verse that I also was located in 2 Timothy that is there is, and it ties in nicely with this Bible text is, 2 Timothy 2.15. I've, I've memorized this and I use this with my walk throughout without the Lord. And it's, I'll just paraphrase, it says, uh, be diligent to present yourself to God as a worker, uh, rightly dividing the word of God. That's as it is written in 2 Timothy 2.15. I simply remember this always as, study to show thyself approved. Again, going back to what I just had mentioned, we need to know the word of God. It's not enough to just simply say, oh, I believe in you, Lord. Even the demons believe in the Lord, but do they walk with the Lord? There's the difference. They don't walk with the Lord. They do not keep his precepts. They do not follow his commandments. So 
So it's not enough for us fellow Christians to just say, yes, I believe you, Lord. No, we must follow his word, walk in his word, and know his word. I think of the, the parable where you have seven um, people coming up to the Lord and saying, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not preach in your name? Were we not followers of you? And the Lord proclaims to them, Depart from me, you doers of iniquity. I, I never knew you. Again, it's not enough to just profess his name and say, Yes, I'm a Christian in name only. You must be a Christian in following him, in following his holy word. You must pray with him, get to know him. Not enough in words is what I'm trying to point out. Actions will show you're following, that you're walking on the narrow path with our Lord and Savior. Therein lies the keys of salvation. I, yes, I believe in the Lord, my, my King and my Savior. He's leading me out and I'm following his commandments. Um, we find that uh, Satan tempts Jesus using scripture in a, a couple of different points that I want to lead out with. We find in Matthew 4.4, 4, First, Satan brings the Lord into temptation, which is the temptation of hunger. This is a very profound temptation. We find that in the book of Genesis, in the very beginning, this is the key concept that the evil enemy, the devil, used in tempting Adam and Eve. In particular, he, he used appetite. He used hunger. And it reads as following. The devil says to our Lord and Savior, if you are the Son of God, knowing full well He is the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. Our Lord and Savior replied to the evil one, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Here we find two key concepts. The Lord not only used the Holy Word to rebuke the enemy, he knew this. So therein lies my point, again, what I'm trying to equivocate to you is that it's not enough to just say we follow the Lord. We must have his concepts, his precepts with, implanted in our heart and mind. The Lord used the, re, the rebuke of scripture that was memorized, is my key point. Again, next key point that the evil one tempted our Savior with was the exaltation of self. And it reads as following. Then the devil took Jesus up into the holy city. This would be the temple in, in Jerusalem on the Temple Mount. Sat him on the top of the pinnacle of the holy temple and said, if, if you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. Jesus replies to the enemy, it is written, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Again, what the Lord is, is admonishing us to do is study His Word, have the Word embedded in our heart and minds. This is the only, this is one of our, our defenses that we are admonished to use. This is our, our sword against the evil one and his temptations. Again, third temptation, using earthly power. It is located in Matthew 4.10. The devil shows Jesus all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these things I will give to you if you will fall down and worship me. Never, never. Jesus replied, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, You shall never tempt the Lord your God, and him shall you serve only. So what we're finding is, in our daily walk with our Lord and Savior, we need to have the Word embedded in our heart and mind. It is our defense. It is our sword. Paul the Apostle tells us that this is our sword that we shall use to rebuke the evil one. We find Christ, what we find, I want to summarize with the temptations using the Word of the Lord. Christ withstood these tests upon appetite, upon the love of the world, and upon the love of display which leads to presumption, these were the temptations that overcome Adam, Adam and Eve and that so readily overcome us. 
Christ's example is before us. He is our Savior. He has presented the one and true example of how we are to live our lives. We follow by His footsteps. Christ is showing us in these three examples of temptation that He used sola scriptura. He used the Holy Word and the Holy Word only. If the Lord being above all, all righteousness, God incarnated Himself, used the Holy Bible, how much more are we to use it? Who are we? We follow His example. This is our key to salvation through Christ our Lord. It's His Holy Word that He has given us. Christ resisted Satan with Scripture. He might have had recourse to his own divine power. True, Christ being incarnated into humanly flesh could have said, you're gone. He could have destroyed Satan right then and there with these temptations. Get away from me, you evil one, and just had him obliterated, essentially. But that was not the way it, it could have been done. Had Christ given to that temptation of, well, that would be anger, therein the, the devil would have won the uh, great controversy. The battle between good and evil would have been tipped over to evil. The Lord had to do this in a righteous manner. Therefore, he used the words and said to him, it is written in a kind and loving way. No forceful malice was protested against the evil one. He was rebuked with the word of God. How much more should we be using the Bible? And when temptation comes to us, let us reverently get on our knees and give praise to the Lord and ask through his holy scripture for protection against the temptations that daily come our way. This is how we can become overcomers. If the sacred scriptures were studied and followed, the Christian fortified to, would be fortified to meet the wily foe. Ellen G. White, quoted in The Desires of Ages, chapter 12, pages 116 and 117, also quoted from Lift Him Up, page 80. Again, following on our theme, the Pharisees rebuked the Lord on the Sabbath day. We find in the Holy Scripture, in Matthew 12, verses 1 through 3, that Jesus went through the grain fields. We know the story of what was occurring. He and his disciples were together on the Sabbath day. And the disciples at this time were hungry. And Jesus began to pl pluck the heads of grain and began to eat. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, Look! Rabbi, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. They had come up with all kinds of precepts for the Sabbath. They had the uh, Pharisees, along with basically, basically the Pharisees and the Sadducees, had come up with all manners of, of daily doings that were created by man. These were things of man. And the Lord was giving a rebuke to this, saying, it's not about all your man-made principles that we are to enjoy the Sabbath. What the Pharisees, along with the Sadducees, have turned the Sabbath into is they turned the Sabbath into a day of burden. Not into a day of joy, not into a day of worship, not into a day of gladness, which is the true Sabbath. So, getting back to what I was saying, located in Matthew 12, verses 1 through 3, we have the Pharisees, how temp giving rebuke to our Lord and Savior, the King. Again, had they read their, they had the Torah, they had the first five epistles in the Old Testament to rely on. It is written, had they written, had they read what was written, they would have understood that this is the Savior incarnated. They did not. So, at this time, getting back to what was occurring, with the Pharisees as they were rebuking the Lord. Jesus replied to them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry and have what those did with him? When they were in the temple, David took a, a part of the sacred uh, daily offering bread, which was only to be given to the priests. 
However, that was changed out once every seven days. So what David did is he had partaken of the bread that had already been seven days old. Yes, it was sanctified for the priests only, but after the seventh day, a new amount of bread was placed there. That's what occurred. Essentially what the Lord was telling them is, yes, David did these things, but you're not looking, you're looking down, you're looking too low, look high. This is about the Lord, this is about the Sabbath day, this is not about the petty things that your man-made principles have put upon us. It's not about that. This is about worship, reverence, and love to your Father on the Sabbath day. Throw away your little petty man-made articles that you're putting on the children of Israel. That's essentially what the message was when he was speaking to the Pharisees who were rebuking him about plucking little grains to feed themselves when they were hungry on the Sabbath day. Return to Deuteronomy 23.5 to find that. The Lord of God allowed the disciples to pluck the ears of corn. The Pharisees should, again, should have been acquainted with the Torah. At this time in history, of course, when Jesus was upon our earth, there was New Testament. Actually, the New Testament was being created, of course. When he was here, he was walking on earth, he was giving us a new, new words that were coming through him. Having said that, the Pharisees knew full and well. They acquainted themselves and had stated that they were masters, along with the scribes, of the then known Bible, which would be the first five books. The Pentateuch is what it's also referred to. So they knew this. It was written. Had they studied it? Apparently not. They would have known that this is the Messiah in flesh had they done so. It was written about. Again, in Matthew 12, 5, he points out to them, have you not read in the law of Moses what, what the priests were doing in the temple? Coming back, he told, gave them scripture that would, well, later as Matthew would write, would point to what the priests were doing in the temple and that this was clearly acceptable. The Pharisees had so twisted and distorted the Sabbath day that it had reflected traditions of men with selfish ambitions. Though so this is a whole other sermon to open up on the Holy Sabbath day that could easily be a sermon in and of itself. But the point I wanted to illustrate here is that what the Pharisees and Sadducees were pointing out to our Lord and Savior, they should have well known had they taken the time to study the Torah. All these things were written about, about our Savior, that he would be incarnated and free us from all of our sins. In Mark 2, 27, Jesus told the Pharisees, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. So he's telling them, as again, Stop with the pettiness. Stop with the traditions of man. This is not what the true Sabbath was created for. The true Sabbath is, is larger than that. You're focusing on the minors and you're not focusing on the majors. The majors is, I'm here with you. I'm here to give you the Holy Word. I am the Lord incarnated. Again, had they studied, they would have seen it. Jesus was test tested by his words, actions, and authority. In Matthew 19, verses 3 to 4, we find that the Pharisees came to him, saying to him, Is it lawful for man to divorce his wife for just any reason? And he answered and said to them, Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female? This is in the book of Genesis. This was right at the very beginning. You know, I think to myself, they were so focused on, they were using the religion as, as a mechanism for just self-justification, self-righteousness. They weren't relying on what they were to rely on. It's putting God first. The religion at this time had come down to a, a mechanism of just self-selfishness. 
Had it been placed God first, they would have known right away that back in the very beginning, when Adam and Eve were created, they were made as one. God institutionalized the marriage sanctimony of a man and a wife coming together and being one. Again, we find in Matthew 21, verses 12 through 13, Jesus went into the temple of God, and he drove out all those who bought and sold in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers. Coming back to, this is my point when I was coming back to, I'm reading it in scripture, that at this time religion had just become selfishness and a money-making tool. And he turned over the seats of those who sold doves. And he proclaimed to them, it is written, my house shall not be called a house, shall be called a house of, of prayer, not a den of thieves as you have made it. We see that the Pharisees and the, and the Sadducees and the scribes at this time had turned the Lord's house of prayer into a money-making profitable business. Not following what they had had this time, the Torah, the first five books of the Holy Word. In Matthew 21, verses 23 through 7, 27, it reads as following. Now when he came into the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people confronted him as he was teaching and said, By what authority are you doing these things? And Jesus said to them, I will also ask of you one thing. Which of you will tell me likewise, by, will tell me likewise, will tell me by what authority I do these things? And he asked them the question. The baptism of John, was it, where was it from? And the Pharisees and the Sadducees reasoned within themselves, and they said, Well, if we say it was heaven, he will say to us, Why did you not believe? But if we say it was from men, we fear the multitude, for all count John as a prophet. So they answered our Lord, we do not know. It is written in the book of John the Baptist, in the book of Isaiah, Isaiah 40, verses 3 through 5, Malachi 3, 1, and also again in Malachi 4, 5. He said to them, neither will I tell you these, these things by what authority I do these things. It is written in every... It is written in every book of the Old Testament and the New Testament of, of our Lord and what He has come to do. We have full scripture giving us what the Lord has proclaimed us to do. So we have no excuses to say in, in that day of judgment, we did not know what you said, Lord. Because there's going to come a time when each and every one of us will be required and to give a testimony, and we will be judged on our actions. All the hidden things will become known. So it admonishes us through the Holy Word to be prepared now. Again, know these things in your heart and your mind. It's not enough to rely on pastors or even, and all these things are healthy and good and righteous. And watch uh, sermons, I watch them a lot on different YouTube channels. It's not enough. What is enough is to know the Lord and have a true, meaningful relationship with Him. That comes first. All the other things are pastures, uh, additional studies on YouTube, additional readings that you may acquire. Our, our prophetess, Ellen White, again, an additional add-on. The first and foremost thing to know is our Lord and Jesus our Savior. Him we must know first. All these other things are great spiritual additions and are very healthy and a great benefit to us that we add on in our knowing of the Lord. But it will always be first and foremost about our Lord and Savior first. He is the one that we must get to know, learn, and memorize. Again, there's going to come a time and I feel it will be shortly. No one knows the day or the time when our Lord will be coming forth. But we do know this. There will be a time 
when we will no longer have our Bibles available to us. That is written. We will be placed in prisons. We will, we will be placed before the administrators, the courts of our, of our system. And we're going to be asked at that time to give a, a detailed description of why you do not, why you have the mark of the beast being, why do you keep the Holy Sabbath day? Why do you do this when we've already inscripted? There'll come a time when they've inscripted a mandate, and it'll start slowly. First, the mandate will be worship on Sunday. They're gonna it's be similar to COVID. We just had a pre-testing of COVID. Okay, with this, how quickly it can be shut down in just an instant. Well, we're gonna see something like this, and this is written, where there's gonna come a time. Well, we won't have a choice. It's going to be, all of a sudden, there's going to be a flip of a switch, and their system's going to say, now we're going to start coming to church. Something may happen. I'm not sure what's going to happen. But something very, very large is going to happen, where the powers that be are going to want us to get us all together and say, yeah, let's have the people go back to church because we've had some large catastrophes or something of this nature has occurred. We need, we need to pray to God and have unity and sanctity. That's wonderful, we should, always, amen. Wrong day. Nowhere is it written in the Lord's holy book that it says we need to worship on Sunday, the resurrection day. The Lord has told us all that we need to know. Would not, I question, and this is not questioning the Lord, but questioning. We know from reading His Holy Word, He's given us all knowledge on what is to come. Question. Having said that, would not the Lord have told us before He was placed on the cross and experienced death and life? Oh, by the way, there's going to come a time when I want to have Sunday, after my day of resurrection, I want this day now to become the day of worship. Had he said that, yes, Lord, yes. Sunday will be the day when, when you have been crucified and when you have been raised because you have told us, it is written, you have told us you want us to switch the Holy Sabbath day, which has been since, since the very beginning, that now you want us to go to Sunday. It is written. We would know. No, that never occurred. The Lord never, ever said I want, after my death and resurrection, Sunday to become the new Sabbath day. That never occurred. And he told us everything before he passed away. He gave us all these instructions on what's going to occur. Why would he not include, oh, by the way, this is also going to happen. Um, the mark of the beast on Sunday, that's acceptable. Never. No. The mark of the beast is not acceptable. We keep the one and true and only Sabbath day that has been given since the, top, the beginning of time. That's what is written. Blessings of it is written. We find in Revelation 1, 3, Blessed is he who reads and hears the words of the prophecy and keeps these things which are written in it. For the time is near. I keep wanting to stress, it's going to be the word and the word alone. Brothers and sisters, now is the time for us to memorize the Holy Word. What are we going to do when our pastors and our fellow brothers and sisters are put in jail? We're not going to have anybody to rely upon. There won't be anybody. This is, see what I'm saying? This is really, really serious that we open up and memorize our, our Holy Word. There will be nobody to say, well, what does the Word say? What's going on now? What do we do now? That's not going to occur. You need to have foreknowledge on what the Holy Word says. It will be too late when all these events occur to ask anybody. They're not going to be around. They're going to be placed in jails. They're going to be out in, and the, some of our brethren and sisters are going to be in the wilderness fleeing for their very lives for protection. We must know the Word now. This is our sword. This is our life. This is our bread of life. It's available to us. So I admonish us all. Let's be takers of the word today. Let's know the word. Let's read it daily. That would be my most sincere plea to, you, to myself and all. We try to take, we must take time to read the word daily. You know, I've, I've been very, very blessed by one of our elders here, Jose. 
he admonished us, and, and rightly so say, he says, it is righteous, it is right that we give our tithes 10% of our gross to the Lord. Should we not, should we not, brothers and sisters, give 10% of our time daily to the Lord? How much is an hour and a half? I think that works out to an hour and a half mathematically, somewhere within there. How much is that in our daily lives? And look, we have nothing but the blessings of the Lord to gain from taking an hour and a half a day. If you, we can start little by little to get there. But if our Lord and Savior has given us His life for us, is it a large request to ask that we give a tenth of our time to the Lord in a week? I think not. Not when He's given His whole life for us. It is a pittance that we should be more than happy and obliged to give Him a tenth of our time in one week. Revelation 27, in closing, I want to leave you with this word to admonish us all. The Lord says, Behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the word of this holy book and the prophecies that were written. There's a blessing here waiting for us all. Grab the golden ring, brothers and sisters. Take the golden ring now while it's available. We all know I can surely attest to you, it is written, there will come a time when we will wish we would have done this on a daily basis. How can we stand firm? Again, as many people, as many brothers and sisters and pastors have admonished us, how can we stand firm with two feet planted on the ground and say, I'm not going to do your, your Sunday thing. I'm not going to go worship on that day. How can you stand firm if you're not even planted here? They're going to take away your finances. That'll be a big one. They're going, to, they're going to take away everything you have. They may even take away your children and you're not able to speak to them. You may be on your own. They may take away your wife. She may be in prison. You're going to be all by yourself. And now what? Let me complicate that. Then they're also going to take away your food. So you're going to have no one. You're going to be starving. Where are you going to be? I'll tell you where you can be. You can be right here in the Word of the Lord and stand with two feet on the Holy Word of the Lord. His bread and His water will be sure to you if you give all your faith to Him. It is written. So let us come to the Lord now and be sanctified in His Holy Word. It's my plea. Thank you, brothers and sisters.